Let's show you what your test one too.
Time's now uh, quarter past one. The inquiry is resumed. Um, unless there's anything that needs to be dealt with now, can we move on to today's last witness, uh, Ms. Armstrong? Um, <clears throat> so thank you. As you can see, Ms. Armstrong's in position. Um, for her evidence in chief, <clears throat> if I could have you please uh, to have to hand um, her proof with, in my version, it's bound in the back, her appendices. Uh, her summary, obviously. Um, the proof of Dr. So yes, Dr. Hudson Corley <coughs> and her appendices. And I think also it's helpful, so if you could have the appendices volumes, that's volume two and three of uh, Mr. Lee, if that's not too far away. And then if we could have um, ready access at least to the um, The visualizations which are, which are CD 5.28. And then lastly, so again, just to have somewhere to hand the built heritage statement, which is CD 5.30. <clears throat> They said, um, Ms. Armstrong has got a very short summary. I would introduce her to the inquiry, ask her for the benefit of third parties to read that summary, if that's acceptable to you, and then we've got one or two points to pick up by reference to the documents. So, Mr. Uh, uh, Ms. Um, Armstrong, can I go first of all to your main proof where we see your Hannah Armstrong, is that correct? It is, yes. And you're a full member of the Institute of Historic Building Conservation, associate of the Chartered Institute of Archaeologists. You have a BA Honours degree in Archaeology, a Master of Science in Conservation of Historic Buildings, and over nine years' experience working in the heritage sector. Is that correct? It is correct, yes. You tell us a little bit about your day-to-day um, -day work and experience at 1.2 and 1.3, and you say you've been employed by Pegasus Group since two th February 2016, and your position is that of associate heritage consultant, and then you give the usual... Um, statement of truth. Correct. Yes. Thank you very much indeed. Now we know that you're speaking to the first reason for refusal um, and you set that out at uh, paragraph 2.6 of your main evidence. I have, yes. And we also know from earlier stages of the process that the reference to the Rington Conservation Area can now be expunged from the reason for refusal. Yes. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, I think the easiest thing to do, if I may, um, Ms. Armstrong, is to ask you, first of all, to read your summary. Yes. Um, we can skip past 111213, um, and uh, we've just mentioned 15. Uh, you do have a deal with the conservation area because others, not the authority, but others take it uh, as an objection. Correct. I set so, out 1.6. So, thank you. Could I ask you then to read 1.7 to the end? It is agreed between the parties that the level of harm arising would be less than substantial within the terms of the MPPF. It is my opinion that the proposed development would result in a very minor impact, at most, to the overall heritage significance of the Grade 1 listed Church of All Saints via a change in setting, with this being at the lowermost end of less than substantial harm. The harm identified arises from changes to incidental views of the Tower of the Church of All Saints from within the appeal site and areas to the south of the appeal site, namely sections of Butts Batch slash Half Yard and the permissive footpath. With regards to views from the appeal site, it is highlighted that new publicly accessible views of the Church of All Saints from areas of public open space have been incorporated into the scheme, secured via the open space and adoption parameters plans and the building heights parameters. I do not identify any harm as arising from changes to views towards the Church of All Saints from the west of the asset, as identified within the officer report and NSC statement of case. Furthermore, I do not identify any harm as arising from changes in views towards the Church of All Saints from the north and east. In all such cases, including views from the south, 
there would be no challenge to the role of the tower as the marker of the historic church within the wider landscape. Whilst recognising that the Barnwell decision set out that the finding of harm to a designated heritage asset gives rise to a strong presumption against the granting of planning permission, as highlighted with another High Court decision, Forge Fields, the presumption is a statutory one. It is not irrebuttable. It can be outweighed by material considerations powerful, apologies, that should probably be powerful enough to do so. As clarified by the Court of Appeal, more due, where the principles of the MPPF, in particular that of paragraph 202, are applied, this is in keeping with the duties of the Planning, Listed Building and Conservation Areas Act 1990, which requires special regard to be paid to the desirability of preserving the architectural and historic interest of a listed building, including any contribution made by its setting. Within this context, it is highlighted that in Barnwell, Justice Lang set out that if the harm to the setting of a Grade 1 listed building would be less than substantial, that will plainly lessen the strength of the presumption against the granting of planning permission, so that a grant of permission would no longer have to be wholly exceptional. With, the Rington, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. With regards to the Rington Conservation Area, it is my opinion that the proposed development, whilst resulting in a change, would not alter the overall transitional character of the approach to or exit from the Rickton Conservation Area along Butts Batch and Half Yard. The proposals would be read as a continuation of the existing modern urban form and intelligible as modern development outside of the historic core of the settlement. When viewed from the south, the proposals would be seen within an area of un with an undeveloped apologies. When viewed from the south, the proposals would be viewed with an area of undeveloped land in the foreground, as is the existing situation. Accordingly, I do not identify any harm as arising to the overall significance of the Rington Conservation Area via a change in setting. Thank you very much indeed. Now, <clears throat> just picking up two points there. Uh, in terms of the conservation area, as we've recorded, the authority has now withdrawn its objection as a result of the parameter plans if they're bound in by the inspector through a condition. Yes, no? that is correct. Um, and uh, just for context, can we just have your appendices to hand. Now, my version <clears throat> is internally paginated, and so I go to page 71 of the printed version. So after a series of photographs, and it's Appendix 5, Conservation Area. Yes. Do you have that? I just want to pick up the, the plan at, uh, or the photograph at plate 5.2. Yes. So do you have that? Yes, I do have it. So we can see the relationship of the appeal site Obviously, we know the proposals sit within the appeal site, not the entirety of it. Um, and we can see the as extended boundary of the conservation area marked in blue. That is correct, yes. And so the principal parties are agreed that no objection arises in respect to the conservation area uh, of a, a harm, even less substantial harm, says so to trigger paragraph 202 for that. That is correct, yes. Thank you very much indeed. Can I then just pick up, you mentioned that uh, 1.14 of your summary um, the observations by Mrs. Justice Lang. Uh, harm to set and create one listed building would be less than substantial. That would plainly lessen the strength of the presumption against grant of planning permission. Yes. Yeah. And here we've got agreement by reference to the <coughs> built heritage statement at 722. So we do. maybe turn that up for me. It's CD 5.30, 722 sits on page 57 of that document. The heading is on the previous page. It's in the section assessment of harm or benefits. The heading is Church of All Saints. Do you have that? I do, yes. And uh, without reading all of the text, we come to the concluding paragraph at 722. In summary, it's concluded the proposed development would re result in, and here it's put, very minor impact, yes. very minor impact to the overall heritage significance of the asset via a change in setting, with this being at the, and then the quotes, lowermost end of less than substantial harm. That is correct, yes. So in Mrs. Justice Lang's terms, what does that do in terms of lessening the strength of the presumption? I think it needs to be a material consideration utilising the wording of um, the Barnwell decision. 
Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. So that's an agreed position, the lowermost end of less substantial harm. Obviously, the 202 balance we leave to planners. We'll hear about that in due course. Correct. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can I just then, with that in mind, uh, take you, I think, again, just for convenience, um, if you take up Mr. Lier's appendices, there's a handy plan in his volume two, the first plan. It's, it's marked blue letter A. Yes, I have that. You have that? And I go here because that shows the appeal site. We know where the church is. I'm only going to consider the church hereafter. We know where the church is. And what this plan does is show all of the public footpaths in the vicinity. It does, yes. Yeah. And do you recall um, Dr. Hudson Macaulay's evidence that the, the, the fabric of the church is the primary source of its importance and significance as a listed building? Yes, I do. Um, and the, uh, the setting contributes to it, but as the, in terms of the setting, the more important aspect of the setting is the close to setting within the churchyard and within the village itself through and between the buildings. Yes, correct recognizing that there is also a contribution made by the wider setting in which the tower sits prominent. Correct. I'm grateful. And uh, do you remember she made a correction to her proof orally? Yes. Removing references to the, the western footpath and inserting for them references to the permissive footpath south of the River Yeo. Yes, I do. And do we see the, I, I've called it the western footpath, it runs um, sort of uh, from the south west to the northeast or from the northeast out to the southwest depending on the two directions you wish to travel yes sort of diagonally across the fields there yes. there's also a, a footpath comes down from um the road to, to congressbury i can't read the number on this particular plan but do you see that the, the footpath runs north south I do, before yes. meeting what's called the two rivers way yes yeah okay and those as we've seen from the photographs um I hope it's acceptable to, to observe, uh, afford views from the west of the church tower. They do. Um, the church is seen within those views um, with the settlement of Brington to the rear, um, modern development to the north and south, and Court Farm complex in the foreground of the church. Thank you very much. And to what extent does the appeal scheme um, interpose itself between the viewer and the tower from those directions? It does not put itself between the viewer or the tower in those directions, Thank it's you. set to one side. And so in terms of the, the connection of the, t of the uh, church tower uh, with the westerly landscape setting, mm -hmm. to what extent is that preserved or harmed? Um, in my view, there'll be no change to Thank the, um, so there'll be uh, preservations, there'll be no change. Thank you very much indeed. Now, if we go around the compass, starting with the north and then moving around northwest and sort of northeast forgive me and then to the east so yes. there's a clockwise journey again what um, impingement if that's a word um, does the the uh, appeal site make in respect of how the church is seen in the context either of the village or the wider landscape in views from the north and the east where these are obtainable um, the site uh, forms part of the wider agricultural landscape to the south of the village um, it does not make any sort of meaningful contribution to the overall understanding of the church in those views thank you very much let's now go to the southerly uh, locations uh, you can see the notation half yard hope i can yes and we'll look at a moment a photograph often called uh, photograph one um or is it two from next to the bridge there we'll yes. look at that in a moment and you can also see the permissive footpath notation which is a green dot i can yes that runs uh, along the southern side of the river yo yes and the inspector is very familiar now the river yo then has um vegetation treed vegetation along its length and there are certain it's been described as windows that intermittently allow views yes, northwards correct. towards the site um, <clears throat> we did this exercise with um, Dr. Hudson Macaulay, but if you plot where the church is, yeah. Yeah, and her concern was views over the appeal site from the permissive footpath, Yes. Yeah, and if you just uh, imagine yourself on that footpath but by reference to this map, 
to what extent in views across the development part of the appeal site is there also intervening development, that is settlement, uh, between the appeal site and the church? Um, in all views along that side, there is intervening built form. Um, I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, when you walk along the permissive footpath to the south of the site, um, there is a modern built form intervening between the appeal site and the church. Thank you very much. Okay. And then just, I did, this has not really been identified before, I think, in the inquiry. When one gets the corner where it says the, with the P of the permissive footpath, Yes. It then appears to turn south. It does, yes. Is there a link across the river over towards the, the western footpaths or not? Not that I'm aware of, no. So the, the, the route, if, you, if one's left the road to go westwards along the river, you then turn with your back to the you settlement do. and go south. Alternatively, I suppose, if you come the other way, you come down the field and then you go to eastwards across yes. the river. And, um, Views at that far end of the footpath as it approaches the wood there, mm -hmm. have you been along there? Um, I have, yes. And to what extent are the apparent views of the church from that very far end? The, to emphasize, the views are sort of very similar as so they are further to the east in terms of that we're still dealing with glimpse views and the, these windows that we were discussing. Um, but by nature of being set further to the west, um, the degree of built form that is in the foreground of the church um, is, is slightly different and diminished, but purely by angle, as you can observe from this plan. Thank you very much. Right. With that in mind, can you take up the, um, uh, the visualizations? Probably keep the plan at page A open. <clears throat> and um, for this, we need to go to CD uh, 5.28. that? Um, I do, yes. Thank you very much. Now, the first thing I want to look at, please, if I may, is the existing situation, not the proposed. Okay. So, do you see the photographs? It's number two, which is the one um, I said near the, near the bridge, but it's, a, it's approaching the corner of the appeal site. Number two. Yes. Number four, which is on the permissive footpath on the south of the river. Um. Yeah. Yes. Number seven and number and letter H. Seven is on the, the western footpath. Yes. And um, H is on the north-south one coming down from West Hay Road. Um, yes. Okay. Um, just with that in mind, t take up the, the first first, so two, which I've got at, at figure uh, 2.1A. So we've crossed the bridge, we're heading into Rington, we can see Rington Village in front of us, and this is a, um, a, a no-leaf shot, I'm not quite sure the, the date it was taken, February, 25th of February shot, yeah? Yes. Um, and just help us with where the church is, would you mind? Um, so the church is located, um, I suppose the easiest way is if you go upwards from the right hand corner of the Rington sign there is a clump of trees which are not in leaf the tower is to the right hand side of those trees with white painted or white rendered buildings in the foreground. Good, thank you I can see the white rendered buildings nice and clearly there's the roof of those which is sort of browny orange colour and then there's a vertical grey brown colour which is the tower It is, yes. Thank you very much and those buildings we know from other evidence that's um, we know it's King's Road, the, it is. the apparently 1926 is their, is their construction date, yes. um, 20th century um, former local authority housing. Yeah? Yes. Okay, that's, that's the existing view from that direction. Can I look, do the same for view four, which is um, on, in, I hope we're in the same um, document, it's figure 2.2a. Yes, I have that in front of me, yes. And it's the top, the top picture in 2.2a, the existing situation. It is. Yeah. And uh, again, just help us with where the church is. If one looks at the, um, the timber fence of the paddock to the north of the site and follows it around the corner, it then terminates near a white gable and the church tower is 
projecting above that gable. It's quite hard to see because of the, the colour of the tower and the landscape beyond in, in, in this view. Yeah, okay. And I can see above the White House and its, and its roof, I can see um, a strip of green, which I assume is a, is a field on the far side of Rington. It is, yes. So you see the church tower, the strip of the green field to the right-hand side, and the white rendered modern buildings in the foreground. I'm oh, grateful. And we'd see the, the strip of green as it were pointing towards the church tower, which just breaks the skyline at that point. Yes. Yeah? Okay, so that's two views from the, uh, the southern direction. And then if you go to um, view seven, just a couple of pages on, figure uh, 2.3a. Yes. You got that? I do. Um, now, there's a large agricultural uh, building. I think that's the piggery. Um, but behind that, do we there see the church? You do. And indeed, elsewhere on this view, if we got out, out of the view of the piggery, we'd see the church on its own. You would, yes. Yeah. And then just for, again for orientation, the houses, the white houses on the ridge between the trees there in that top frame, that's what? Um, that's the um, King's Close properties that we were looking at yeah. previously. Thank you very much. Okay. And then lastly in this little exercise, H. Um, which is a couple of pages on. Uh, do you have that? It's my uh, figure 2.6a. Yes, I have that in front of me. Uh, coming down from the north from West Hay Road over to the sort of left-ish of the uh, photograph. You can see, I hope, the village, the pylon, the tree there, and then the church. You can. The church is seen set within the um, settlement with the wider agricultural land in the foreground and the wider um, landscape with the, the rising hills to the south. Thank you very much. Now, now, one aspect that one often comes across in these sorts of cases is, is consideration of from where can one best appreciate the asset in question. Correct, yes. So having done that exercise in the existing circumstances, between um, the, the southerly views and the westerly views, where would you conclude for the inspector that one can best appreciate um, the church uh, and its tower and their significance in the landscape? As set out in my evidence, when I undertook the site visit, I took into account the views from the surrounding area and the contribution as to how that may vary from different locations. Looking at the views from the west, um, the church is set clearly within the settlement, but the relationship with the agricultural hinterland is closer than one may exhibit from the south because of the limited development, shall we say, at Court Farm. Um, and one is also um, closer to the church by nature of how that public right-of-way network, whilst appreciating that setting is not dependent on public views, which obviously has an influence on the experience and appreciation. So in this context, um, the, the Western views can be considered to make a, a, could be considered to make a greater contribution than those from the south. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so from uh, the more important westerly views, if we just run, run on to the idea of the future, and if you still have H to hand for the sake of argument. Um, I do, yes. What material impact does the scheme have in terms of the ability to read or not read, the ability to appreciate or not appreciate the historic s significance of the church tower and hence the church? There'd be no change in the experience or appreciation of the church from the West. Thank you very much indeed. And um, to what extent, therefore, would you support Dr. Hudson Macaulay in terms of deleting the references to the Western footballs and substituting for the Southern footballs? I would, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Let's then look at the Southern again. So I'm now looking for the future situation, but I'm going to go to um, uh, photo four first. Do you have that? Uh... Or, yes, the wireframes view point four. Yes. Got it. Now, we saw the existing shot with the, I get to call it the green sliver. Yes. Yeah, and the white house. Yes. Yeah. And then if you look to the photo below, that's the wireframe, as it were, at the beginning of the process. So, so uh, without uh, additional planting and out without it maturing. Correct, yes. Yeah. Just help us with how much of the green sliver we can still see, and then hence how much of the tower 
we can still see compared with the existing view? So the, the slither of the green field to the right-hand side of the church would still be visible. And what one can do by looking through the, the yellow shading of the wireframe is see that the house that is in the foreground of the church is actually pretty much in line with the existing ridge heights in that location. So the extent of the church that is being obscured is minimal, if existing at all. In comparison with what? In comparison with the existing situation when you follow across the, uh, the, gay, the ridge height of the centre of the existing houses. Thank you very much indeed. Now, I say, <clears throat> this is a, a wireframe, it's not a fully rendered view. A couple of pages on, you get um, it superimposed on the wireframe uh, um, growth both in winter and in summer. You do, yes. Yeah. And so in terms, although the, the, um, the tower itself, you say, is, is either not or only minimally uh, diminished in what the amount that can be seen, in terms of the context in which it's placed, what comment do you have to say about that? Even where we start to look at the, um, I'm looking at the last one, which is the vegetation as it starts to come into its summer leaf, the church tower is still visible, projecting above the, the, the settlement of Rington. Um, it is still understood as located within that settlement. And also, m similar to the situation, or much as the situation today, situated within the core of the settlement, modern development within the foreground, agricultural development in the foreground of that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, for view two, the, these visualizations were done in June 2021, um, and since then there's been some changes to the illustrative layout, and then there's, of course there's the parameter plan. So you can put that document away, because for view two, what I'm going to ask you to do instead <clears throat> is go to the 2022 visualization, which you will have amongst Mr. Lier's appendices. And it's this time, it's his volume three, if you have that. I do. <clears throat> May 2022. Are you there? I have that to hand, yes. Um, and uh, we can see from the aerial photograph location of viewpoint two, we can see the illustrative layout then set out um, superimposed on the photograph, the church just creeping into the frame at the top of the picture. The tower isn't Im immediately um, identifiable at that point. But if we look to the, the photographs, the existing situation is on the top of figure 2.1. It is. And we've seen an equivalent of that. And then we have the form proposed in the photograph below. And then as we move through figure 3.1, we then have 3.2 and 3.3, which is when there's some growth to the um, proposed planting. Correct, yes. Yeah? Okay. Just help us then uh, with the comparator between the existing situation from this direction and the proposed situation in the scheme before the inspector. Uh, what has been sought to be done and what has been achieved? As we discussed in this view as existing, the church tower is seen um, set within the settlement with modern development in the foreground and agricultural development in the foreground of that. Um, apologies, I keep saying agricultural development, agricultural land. Um, and this demonstrates that the same will remain the case in that the view corridor will be maintained towards the tower of the church and it will be continued to be understood and experienced as set within the village with modern development in the foreground and agricultural land in the foreground of that taking into account the existing that's sorry the proposed development thank you very much indeed now taking all these matters together um you've reached through the built the built heritage uh, assessment, the conclusion you have at 722 of lowermost uh, impact on significance. Yes. That's now common ground between you and the authority. Um, there is um, a factor that's also brought into play 
um, which is the potential for um, new views within the settlement, within the proposed development itself Correct. as a heritage benefit. Can you just help me with this? To what extent in arriving at the conclusion of less, uh, lesser most harm, lesser most scale within the um, less than uh, uh, harm category, um, did you factor in any heritage benefit in a sort of net calculation exercise? The conclusion set out um, within the heritage statement at 7.22 and carried forward into my evidence does not take into account the heritage benefit. I have not undertaken an internal heritage balance. Um, that assessment of harm is based purely on the development and the change that will result from it. Thank you. And so whose task is it to take into account the potential for a heritage benefit as well as the heritage harm? Be the decision makers. Thank you very much. So those are the matters in chief. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Can we have the uh, cross-examination? <coughs> Excuse me, sir. Yes, of course. Um, Ms. Armstrong, on that last point, um, what am I understanding? The benefit uh, is presumably, you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, from the, uh, what would be the new viewpoint in the circular public open space to the northeast uh, of the development. Is that right? The, the, the sort of, just the, 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 I shall start that again. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Um, so yes, yeah, so the benefit that we're talking about is the introduction of the new public view from that northeastern corner, yes. um, and it's been referenced within my evidence, but as part of the overall um, careful design of the scheme, because we've also got the route of the road aligning to the church. Yes. Um, well, uh, that's interesting, but I'm not sure. Do correct me. If, try not to speak too close to that. Do correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think we see any viewpoints, do we, for that? We have not. No. Um, there is no viewpoint submitted as part of the, um, the appeal submission that we have in front of you. Um, it is obviously detailed within the parameters, plans, and the areas of open space, um, reflected also in the heights as how that can be achieved. Yeah, but you, you, you see, if the inspector is going to form a judgment, um, assuming he wants to form a judgment on that issue, uh, as to <clears throat> uh, to what extent this is in truth a benefit, mm -hmm. we need to have some idea what you are going to see of the church. Um, to an extent, you, we, you need to know how many people were likely to be going there to form an idea about the extent of the benefit. But we don't have any idea about that at all, do we? Want either of those things? We don't have a visualisation, no. And no. where I've um, addressed this in my evidence of paragraphs 6.44 and 6.45 Indeed. is identifying it as part of the careful consideration of the proposed yes. layout um, and as a demonstration as to how the layout has been informed yes. by the heritage constraints and ongoing discussions with the yes. local authority. Yes, I follow, I follow that. But let me just <clears throat> follow up that point a little bit more in a slightly different direction um, because, excuse me, I, <clears throat> I raised with you the issue of the extent to which people might be using the public open space uh, on the development. Brings me to another point which is um, when one is considering the permissive footpath in particular to the south and the, the use of that in conjunction with other footpaths. <clears throat> Do you remember the evidence that was given by uh, people who live in and around Rington about the popularity uh, of that footpath? I do, yes. Yes, because they made it pretty clear that a lot of people use that footpath. Um, it's therefore popular. Some, somebody, I can't remember which witness it was, talked of the views from that footpath. So <clears throat> that's important, isn't it, when one is appreciating the significance of this particular heritage asset? The views from the permissive, per permissive footpath, as been discussed, do contribute to the experience and appreciation yes. of the church. Um, I don't believe that that's in dispute, and we, we have discussed the change that would occur in those views. All we are doing, and to sort of highlight, is that there are, at present, no public views of the church 
from the appeal site. The layout has been carefully designed to allow for the creation of public views, be that from the routeway that runs through it or the area of public open space. Yes. But to, I would just like to say to be clear, we have never put the case across that that should be considered in lieu of any change that may occur from the south, which I believe is something that was also discussed yesterday. Yes, I, I, I'm just curious really because if one uses a permissive footpath and one looks back towards the village and the church, I'm taking that particular viewpoint, then one at the moment is looking at the church in the context of the development at the edge of the village as it is at the moment, and then from the footpath in the context of views across what is at the moment an agricultural field, the appeal site in other words. Yes. Yes? Yes. That's the position. Okay. Now, um, if the development goes ahead, then, and I'll come to the wireframe separately, if the development goes ahead, then that view will be, I'll try and use a, a, a neutral term, um, will uh, have to be appreciated in the context of the development, won't it? It will be viewed within the context of the development, yes. yes. And just to pick up a, a pick up on the point so the inspector knows where I'm going in due course, that uh, one of the aspects of the English Heritage Guidance on this topic is that uh, you have to be careful when making a judgment about existing development, um, which is there and may hinder the appreciation of a heritage asset, you have to be careful uh, about the question of cumulative impact, don't you? You do, and I believe that we discussed the paragraph in cum of cumulative impact um, within Historic England guidance yesterday. That yeah. does obviously refer to the, the consideration of what might be additional change. What I have considered here is the baseline, and the baseline is the existing situation with the existing development, and I have considered the change that will occur on the existing baseline. But you have, <coughs> I see. Um, so you haven't taken into account the fact that there is um, existing development between the appeal site field and the, and the church? Well, of course I have, because it's the baseline. You have? Oh, I see. Because All right. the well, existing development is the baseline situation. Yeah, but if I've understood you correctly, or if I've understood your evidence correctly, and please tell me if I'm wrong, if I've understood your evidence correctly, what you are, what you are saying is that uh, as part of that appreciation of the church, one has to take into account the existing baseline situation, which includes the modern development between the viewer on the footpath and the church. Uh, that's right, isn't it? Well, that's correct, yes. Yeah, oh, yes. But all I'm putting to you um, at the moment is, and I'm sort of flanging it up because I'll come back to it, is that English heritage cautions us to be careful um, about that situation because of the issues of cumulative impact. In other words, the existing situation being added to and being made, for example, more harmful. Well, I'm not sure if there's been a clear discussion on how harmful the existing development is to the church. I don't know if that's something that we no, want to get into. But Forgive me for interrupting you, but that, that is the position as a matter of principle, isn't it? Well, the baseline is the situation and the development that All is right. existing and how that may contribute to the okay. understanding or influence the existing appreciation right. of the asset is, of yeah. course, a consideration. Okay, I'll come back to the cumulative um, okay. impact issue and we look at the guidance. It's probably the easier way okay. of doing it. I, I'm my fault for sidetracking. Um, <clears throat> so, um, we're all agreed that we're talking about the um, significance, um, impact on significance of a grade one um, listed church, St. Nicholas Church, and we know um, don't we, as a matter of fact, that grade one and grade two star buildings are um, in the uh, highest and most important category of listed buildings? They are, yes. And grade one and grade two star together, I think, are something like, you'll know better than I do, something like less than 10% of the total of listed buildings overall. I wouldn't want to confirm that without double-checking the exact no. figures, but yes, they, they, um, they do make up a, a smaller percentage than, say, shall we say, yeah. grade two. Yes, I, I mean, without holding you to a specific figure, um, I understand your, your caution on that, um, it would be fair to say, wouldn't it, that, it, that we are looking at something in the region of less than 10%, are we not? 
again, without that figure, right. I, I, don't, yeah. I, I no, no. acknowledge that it's less, but I don't want to agree a percentage no, no, without well, no knowledge. No, that's perfectly fair, I mean, which is something that we checked in any event. So I'm not going to um, uh, uh, try, and, try and pin us down on that. And uh, we are talking again about an asset that in terms of the framework policy, um, and paragraph 199 of the framework, it has the um, highest uh, degree of importance. Uh, it does, yes. Yes. Um, and we're talking, of course, about the setting, the significance of the setting. We all uh, accept that. And we all accept, uh, you and Dr. Hudson Macaulay accept, that the, any impact upon the significance of the setting is at the lower, uh, lowermost end of the uh, less than substantial harm. Okay. And you've referred to the cases, and I'm not going to cross-examine you about the cases, because that's a matter of submission uh, for the advocates. Um, can, can I just try and put this in some sort of layman's context, and I apologize for doing it in that way, but because, of course, I am a layman uh, in these matters, whereas you are the expert. So, in layman's terms, we've got, haven't we, in this village, uh, a big church with a considerable presence. Is that fair? I believe that you'd want to quantify that from where you are viewing it from, but it is, um, as identified in the evidence, clearly visible from within the settlement and the surrounding area. Well, I, I put it as a big church with a considerable presence, because, of course, obviously, um, we can see from your photographs, and uh, I'm sure you and Dr. Hudson Macaulay are at IDEM on this, that um, the, you appreciate the church uh, from close to in the central core of the village, and your, your photographs make that, make that clear, and I have no issue with that, of course. But what makes this church have a considerable presence in the wider landscape is the tower, isn't it? Well, the, the tower is the highest part of, of the, the structure, so naturally yes. it would be the most visible. Yes, obviously enough, I suppose. And the tower is visible, as we know, roundabout. You've been through the viewpoints, and I'm not going to go back into much of the detail on that. And we're also agreed that uh, there, is, uh, there are no design views. No, there is no sort of medieval capability Brown who might have wanted to um, put the tower, have the tower put up and then say, look at it from here and here and here. No, Nothing not. like that. No, okay. But nonetheless, um, in the case of churches like this, where you've got a tall, four-stage tower. Um, somebody, when it was built, whether it be the incumbent or whether it perhaps more likely be the benefactor or benefactors, wanted to make a statement, didn't they, about its presence? They would have wanted to make a statement about the wealth, mm -hmm. about the presence of the church. Yeah. Um, but I, I maintain that that needs to be taken into consideration as to where you are viewing it from. I mean, for example, to, to hand right now, I have um, the visualizations that we were looking at earlier with the existing view from close to the Rington sign. And when you take into account everything else in that view, is that um, the strong presence in that view? I'm not entirely sure. So I'm saying you have to take it on a location and location and viewpoint basis. Well, of, 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 of course. But let's hypothetically, I mean, we, I don't suppose we know, and you'll tell me if I'm, if I'm wrong about this, but let's assume that we've got wealthy, a wealthy benefactor or benefactors, and they want a church put up to their own glory, but they will say to the glory of God um, and perhaps the congregation, but they will want it, as I've said already, um, to be a presence in the landscape from wherever you view it in that landscape, won't they? They will want it to be apparent. Yes. Um, but I believe that the strength of presence has altered over time and is different from varying locations, as it would have been at the time of construction. Of, 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 of course, of course, of course. I'm looking at this, sorry, it's almost a bad pun, in the round. Um, <laughs> and. I'm not at the moment suggesting that you can see it better from point A or point B or point C. We can look at that in a moment or two. But as a matter of general principle, where you've got a church built like this with a tower like this, then it's making a statement about the benefactors or about God or whatever it may have been in the Middle Ages. And 
the statement is of something large which is to be seen. It is. It's yes. you know, it is designed to be seen and it is almost a marker in the landscape yes. of that settlement or that the church is there. Yes. yes, you use the word marker in your proof and I was going to ask you about that because that seems to me to be quite a good way of putting it. So when we're talking about the marker, we're talking principally here, I mean, not, not, not completely because of veneer views, but we're talking principally here about the size and height of the tower. And its location within the settlement. Its location? Within the settlement. So, Within the settlement, yes. yes, I'm sorry, I, I missed the last word, my fault. Um, and, of course, um, one's appreciation of its significance in this context is because it's a big tower and one can appreciate um, close to, and indeed from a distance, the architectural features, can't one? Yes, obviously it varies depending on closeness, but you get a of sense course. of the architectural detailing, yeah, yes. Yeah, I mean, let me, make it, let me make it plain. I'm putting the questions to you in a general way. I am not, I would not say, for example, in closing submissions, that because you'd accepted that it had a presence and uh, that you could see the architectural features, that you can see the architectural features or it has a presence in the same way from every viewpoint roundabout. I'm not putting it like that. Okay. That would be unfair. We'll look at, as I said, the viewpoints in, um, um, shortly. Um, so, uh, the architectural features. I don't think we need to look at the architectural features, but they, they are referred to, aren't they, in the... Um, um, the um, uh, yes, historic England listing of the listing of the building, which we see in Dr. Hudson Macaulay's Appendix Six. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, uh, again, just taking this presence point just a stage further. Obviously, um, somebody who's building the church, the benefactors, whoever it may be, they're having the church built. Um, if they hadn't wanted to make its presence felt, my words. Um, they wouldn't have needed to build a four-stage tower. They could, like many English parish churches, have um, a squat tower which doesn't rise much above the nave or the chancel. Indeed, it, it was the decision of the builder, the benefactor, whoever at that time, taking into account you know, various phases of easy class, ecclesiastical architecture. Um, yes. Yes. But, but that, that's the point, isn't it, really, that if you don't want to make its presence felt or only want to make its presence only felt um, in the immediate locality, then you won't necessarily stick a big tower on it. That's correct, yes. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> yes. Um, so, its um, significance um, comes from its height and prominence, it can be seen, um, you can see the architectural um, detailing. Uh, the extent to which you can see it obviously will vary upon your position in the, in the settlement or in the landscape. So, um, sorry, my fault, I've lost them, there they are. <clears throat> Could we just, just have a, um, a glance at the, the wire, <coughs> the, excuse me, the wire frames which are at 5.28, I think, the ones you were looking at. Um, and just let me be sure I've got this right. <clears throat> um, yeah, viewpoints two and four. Let's go to those. Viewpoint two is 2.1a, I think. Okay, yes. So, yeah, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have, excuse me, we, we have <coughs> at the topmost um, photograph, we have the existing viewpoint of view, of course, and we can see where the church is, and you've helpfully pointed it out to us. And then, then we have that view, of course, in, in the context of the agricultural landscape, which is... Uh, I don't know. You've produced the um, Ordnance Survey and other plans going back for, I suppose, a couple of hundred years now. Um, but I have the impression, tell me if I'm wrong, um, that the agricultural fields that we see in the topmost photograph are uh, much as they would have been, as far as one can tell from the, the plans, as they are now. I, I don't say the enclosures would have been exactly the same, because that's probably not true. But there doesn't seem, for example, to be any, any intervening building or anything of that sort. 
No, the, the historic mapping does not show any built form within the site. No, no. So, uh, save to the extent that agricultural practices change, um, they would appear to be much the same. Well, there's no evidence of, on any of the Orland survey plans of, of, any, of any woods or any intervening uh, woodland, copses, whatever, spinnies, uh, between this viewpoint and the church. The, the earlier ordnance surveys often shown, uh, showed things like that. That's correct. So the earliest map we have is the 1738, which appears to show, I would say, fairly strong vegetation boundaries um, yes. on it, and I think some, also some evidence of earthworks more um, identified, but yes. no, nothing such as a copse of trees. No. Okay, thank you very much. Then, <clears throat> if one then looks at... Um, I'm looking at 2.1 as I think I said, and if one looks at the bottom photograph, when then, then one has um, the, the built form there. I appreciate this is not an accurate representation, but it tells us where it's going to go. And as you point out, there would be um, a, if you like, viewing corridor um, between the dwellings. That's correct, yes. yes. But one would have to notice in, in, in forming an assessment of the, of the effect, one would have to notice two things. First of all, the view of the church would be through that viewing corridor. And secondly, whereas before, one would have had a gradual view of the church across the fields as one approached on the road, now that view, gradual view as one approached uh, along the road, will be taken up in the main, not entirely, but in the main by the houses, wouldn't it? There was, there will obviously be a change in that gradual yes. view. I think we previously described it as kinetic um, as you move through the landscape. But within all of those views, the church will still be seen within the settlement with, mo with sort of um, the modern settlement edge in the foreground and as well as a further bit of agricultural land. Yes, but to the extent to which the setting, which is an agricultural setting, is important and would have been important in centuries past. The extent to which that is important has now been diminished by the built form, hasn't it? I would say that there's been a change yes. and there is obviously, we are changing one aspect of the agricultural hinterland. Yes. But, but you say that there is less than substantial harm to significance that less than substantial harm must come from something, and I'm assuming, and you'll tell me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming that that less than substantial harm comes from the fact of the built form, doesn't it? It comes from the fact that there will be a change in the ability to experience and appreciate the church from some locations. Yes, but that, that comes, that's what my question was, that comes from the built form, doesn't it? It derives from the reduction in the um, experience and appreciation deriving from the built yeah. form. <laughs> I appreciate that. Of course it's a reduction in experience. What I'm putting to you is that the reduction in experience comes from the presence of the built form. I mean, it seems to be perfectly simple. Yes, because it would be the built form that would reduce the visibility. Yeah, of course. Good. Well, I thought we'd get there. Thank you very much. Um, so, if we then... Press on. And I appreciate, of course, that there'll be landscaping and all the rest of it, so I'm not going to ask you about that because that is a, a, a landscape matter. If we go then to, I think you were invited to look at viewpoint four. Yes, you were. And viewpoint four, just so I, we're looking at the same one, I have got as being 2.2.a. That's correct, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we can see um, in the topmost um, view, and the, the reason I use my glasses is because my eyesight is appalling um, and has been for a long, long time. Um, one can see where the, where the church is in the uh, topmost um, viewpoints, and then, then one can see the built form. And again, I mean, the problem with that is that, well, I'm not sure that you can, tell me if I'm wrong, I'm not sure that you can actually see the church um, with the built form in place. With the proposed one in the bottom? Yes. You can, yes. Yes. But, but um, one's appreciation of it is very much diminished, is it not? As I've uh, discussed in, uh, in chief, if you look at the ridge height of the building that is in front of the church, yes. it is in line with the 
ridge line of the building that is already in front of the church in yes, this view. I, so you're not reducing the extent of the tower that is visible? Well, I, I'm not sure about that. Would um, it be useful if I pulled up a digital version and zoomed in, or I think we have some large, do we have any large versions of the wireframes? Well, <laughs> I, I can do it because if you zoom in, it might make it, I can prove my point. <laughs> It's quite all right. I, I'm, I'm not going to stop you looking at anything you need to look at. <laughs> Please, uh, don't misunderstand If me. it would assist, I would be more than happy to pull up a digital copy and zoom in. <coughs> well, sir, if you've got it, um, then I don't need to... Uh, you okay. be able to... Uh, you have. Well, that's fine, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I... No, I, I know. I, I could see the green sliver even on my photograph. Um, no, no, I, and no, no. <laughs> I, I could make I could make out the church. It was my eyesight that was causing me problems. No, no more than that. Um, okay. Um, sorry. Um, make sure I've got the right. That's not good. Sorry, I was going to look at Mr. Lee's, but perhaps I don't, I don't need to in the light of what you've just said. Oh dear. Um, no, I think probably not. Thank you very much for that. Um, right. Yes, let's just a moment, and it shouldn't be any more than that. Let's just have a look at GPA 3, please, um, which is a core document. Thank you very much. Core document G3. And it's page four. At least it is on mine. Yes, I have that in front of me. Thank you very much. Um, cumulative change, it says, right-hand side column. Where the significance of a heritage asset has been compromised in the past by unsympathetic development affecting its setting. Um, I will pause for a moment. Um, do you say, and we'll take it for these purposes, that we're using the southern viewpoints looking north towards the church, either from the permissive footpath or from the, uh, the road or close to that. Do you say that um, the significance of the heritage asset has been compromised in the past by that development if it's unsympathetic? There's obviously a change that has, has occurred during the 20th century, but when we take into account the significance of the asset as a whole and the varying ways in which setting can contribute, and we've discussed the more important elements, um, I think it would be difficult to understand quite how much the overall significance of the asset has been compromised. So it may not have been compromised, is, is your position? It, it is my position, but I, and I don't believe we sort of previously touched upon the compromise of the existing development I mean if this is a if this is a non-point from the point from my <laughs> point of view of my cross-examination I'm happy to leave it because if you're if you're if you're saying that the existing development doesn't compromise the setting of the listed church that's fine I'll I'll put this document I think away. we'd have to decide where we were going to take that point of compromise from would it be the 1920s would it be the 1960s all I can confirm as I have done already is that I have taken all of that into account with regards to the existing baseline, the existing contribution, and the existing experience and appreciation. Yeah. Let, let me try and make my question a bit clearer. <clears throat> You've seen, or we have seen, in the wireframe viewpoints uh, that we've looked at, and you've seen in the uh, earlier um, viewpoints of Mr. Lie that you, that you looked at, um, we've seen that from the south, whether one is looking from the permissive footpath or whether one is looking from the road, we, can, we have seen that the church is viewed in the con it appears over and is viewed in the context of a certain amount of housing development. It is, yes. Yes. Now, I, I'm, I'm not going to enter into Mr. Lier's debate about when those houses were built um, because I don't think that's necessary for present purposes. But are you saying 
that the houses one sees in those views, which intervene between the viewer and the church, are you saying that they have in any way compromised um, the significance of this uh, church heritage asset? I'm going to quantify what I was going to say first. So I think taking all of that into account, we need to consider the distance of the appeal site from the church um, and the, the level of change that has occurred. I, mean, I don't know what the situation was prior to that to understand in terms of topography, um, earlier historic development, because obviously there is development within the core to the south of the church. I, and I, I, I doubt anybody in this room, would be able to give an appreciable understanding as to what the view was prior to the 1920s to understand how much the understanding of that church may or may not have been altered. Well, I, 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 it's your expert view that I'm, I, I'm asking for, you see. I mean, if you, <clears throat> you, you might say to me, um, the setting of the historic setting of the church, the significance of it has been compromised in a particular way. Fine, I could ask you questions about that. You might say to me, um, it, its um, significance in terms of its setting has not been compromised, in which case we can move on. Or you might say to me, I suppose alternatively, I can't really say one way or the other whether it has been compromised. I believe it's difficult to say one way or the other when okay. taking into account that the church is seen within the context of the existing settlement of Rington, which it would have been prior to that development because we know that there was earlier development to the south of the church, albeit north of yeah. uh, Kings Close. So with, without being un, unfair to you in any way, I hope, um, the, the, the answer to my question about whether the setting has been compromised by the existing development is that you can't say I think it's difficult to understand without taking into account a number of factors. Okay, well, that's all right. I, I, if you can't say, then I can't take it any further, and I won't. Um, right, done with that. Yes. Um, sorry, I've got a note to ask you some questions about your proof. Let me just check that. And Sorry, it's, I've got Mr. Lier's. One more point I just wanted to make, I was just double checking I was correct before I said it. Um, I just wanted to highlight that the use of the term cumulative impact was not something that arose during the determination of the application no. for us to consider. So I just wanted to double check first and then quantify that one. No, well, that, 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 that's all right. I, uh, um, I, I was only concerned with, with the position about the existing development and you've told me your view on that and I'm, I'm okay. not pursuing it any further. Um, Page 13, please, of your, of your proof of evidence, <clears throat> where um, you've got a table and, 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 and you set out, um, helpfully, your response to points raised within the council's statement of case. Um, I just want to flick down some of these and we can deal with them, I think, quite quickly. In 5.1, um, you, you make the point, and we've agreed that it is the case, that there are no specific design views of the, of the church, and I've dealt with the size and presence of the church and so on, and I'm not going to try and revisit that. Um, then uh, the next one, 5.2, um, you made a point that the compass points were wrong, indeed they were, um, and, and it, they, they were, as you correctly said, they should have been. Um, you see, um, part of my questions uh, about cumulative impact came uh, from passages like this, where you refer to the post-war development to the south of the church, which forms part of the current baseline, um, 
and you then say the manner in which the settlement is developed should not place any greater importance on the undeveloped nature of the appeal site, in particular when taking into account that it's located 200 metres about from the Church of All Saints and, the, and then the intervening built form. Well, you've told me already that you can't really say whether the intervening built form um, has um, an unfortunate uh, a detrimental impact upon the uh, uh, historic significance of the church. So I, I'm not quite clear what it is you're saying in that particular paragraph. I'm basically identifying as here is that, you know, similar to where we discussed the views from the north, from the east, south, the west, and the, the varying ways in which the church can be experienced, um, that the, the fact that the, the southern part of the settlement um, was subject to expansion later um, doesn't um, place any greater importance on the undeveloped nature of our site to the south. So I, I suppose it was more trying to quantify my own understanding of where that paragraph was going. Um, and, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just kind of emphasising that the way in which the settlement has expanded at various points in its history should not elevate the importance of this site. All right. Um, <clears throat> 5.3, um, the church and the, well, forget the conservation area, um, for our purposes, are both defined by their wider rural landscape. Um, well, that's a truism, isn't it? Um, they're the church has a presence which is to be seen in the rural landscape. The rural landscape provides definition for that view, doesn't it? I believe in um, cross-examination yesterday, um, actually I believe it was in evidence in chief yesterday, um, that the term defined was agreed to probably not to be the right term. Uh -huh. um, and with that regard, my, my statement here is to identify that this statement could be read as slightly misleading. You know, the rural landscape does not completely up against, go up against the church. The, no. the contribution that the setting makes to the asset is not defined or co de definitively associated with the rural landscape. As has been agreed, there are elements that are offer a greater importance. So it was more the term defined, shall we say, which okay. I think we dealt with yesterday. Well, then, then we can presumably agree that the, the, the rural landscape is obviously part of its setting and helps to uh, helps one to appreciate its significance. I believe that we have discussed that that does form part of the setting that contributes to the asset but is not the greatest part of the setting. No, one of the elements I, I of the setting. think um, Dr. Hudson McCauley agreed with you uh, 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 on that. Um, yes. Um, 5.8 is um, I think not contentious in the sense that um, the level of harm is, is agreed, not quite as it is there, I appreciate, but it's agreed. Um, yes, I think probably um, with the other matters I've covered, that is that is the end of that particular um, section. Um, and then just let me check one or two other things. Yes. Um, if you just go to your page 17, please, um, paragraph 4.35. Sorry, I'm just checking something else. Yeah, I'm done with that. Um, <clears throat> 4.35, you say, uh, the local plan policies cited by the council are not compliant with the framework. Uh, it is thus concluded that the utilization of the framework is more relevant, etc. Um, yes, I mean, 
I can ask you some detailed questions about that, but I, I'm assuming that that is really a matter for your planning witness, policy compliance. In that terminology, yes, but again, this is a matter that was discussed yesterday where it was highlighted yes. that those policies do not allow for the, um, the balance set out in the MPPF to be undertaken. I and they also um, could be considered overly restrictive in relation to the Act as well. Well, I, I understand all that, and you're quite right that Dr. Hudson Macaulay agreed that that was the position. Um, if I'm going to ask more questions, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, that the person I really should ask them to is, um, uh, on planning issues like this, is probably your planning witness. Is that fair? Uh, yes, I mean, obviously I've set out my position within I know my you evidence, have. so... Yes, that's something that can be dealt with by the planning witness. I, I, I want to ask some detailed questions about planning, and I would not normally ask them of a heritage witness. I'm only um, clearing that, as it were, with you. Uh, but I will, in those circumstances, ask them of the uh, planner. Excuse me a second. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Mr. Storer. Uh, it's always difficult to follow another, uh, I, sh I should imagine it is, I don't know how to do it myself, but uh, I should imagine it's difficult to follow somebody else's cross-examination. Do, do, do you need a minute or two just to sort of work through your notes? To... Yeah, I mean, yes, Mr. Walsley has covered a, a lot of our points. Um, if uh, a couple of moments just to... Uh, yeah. should we, my, well, uh, should we say, well, it's, it's no, I'm being a bit skimpy here, it's, it's, it's only three minutes till half past. Will that be enough or do you need a little bit more? Uh, I hope it will be long enough, sir. Yes, I will go with that. Uh, okay. Well, if you do need you. a little bit more, uh, that's fine. We'll just, we'll just pause. I, I, I won't adjourn formally, but I'll just give you until half past. And if you do need some more time, we can adjourn. Okay, okay. thank you, sir. So we'll just pause till half past. Okay, it's, uh, it is now half past, um, certainly by my clock anyway. Um, do, do you need a little more time? Are you okay, Mr. Storer? 
No, I'm uh, fine. I may be uh, a little shuffling of notes, I, uh, but that's actually fine. Thank you. Okay, whenever you're ready then, please. Good afternoon. Um, so, I, um, I think most of our um, points have been very well covered by Mr. Wardsley, and I certainly don't wish to um, take up any more time. I would just, um, uh, get, uh, if I may, just go to your evidence, uh, Ms. Armstrong, uh, on, uh, let me see, page 18, your point 5.7, and you have... Um, You've, you've highlighted the differences between our position and the um, council's position. Um, and I'll just take you to, uh, you say, 5.7. Um, if you, uh, we've identified it as um, substantial harm to the Church of All Saints. And if you could just read the, um, that paragraph out for me, please. Yes, uh, with regards to quasi-identification of substantial harm to the Church of All Saints. It has been clarified in the High Court that substantial harm would be harm that would have such a serious impact on the significance of the asset that its significance would either vitiate it altogether or very much reduced. And uh, so vitiated is destroyed, um, which obviously you're, um, you're, you're contending it, uh, it won't be. But uh, if that all, all very much reduced, um, and that I would uh, submit that is where our position is, that uh, with the built form in the foreground uh, on this site, um, then I, I think that probably explains where we are um, on that. Um, have you got any comments you'd like to make on that, please? Um, I do, yes. Um Obviously, the, the uh, subsequent paragraphs to that statement make reference to the PPG, uh, the Planning Practice Guidance, uh, which is c included as a core document at G5. Um, that confirms that you know, substantial harm is a high test. And in this circumstance, it is agreed between myself um, as the you know, as a professional in the heritage sector assessing this asset and also that of the council, that the heritage significance of the listed building is principally derived from the physical fabric of the building. We acknowledge that the setting also contributes, but that there are other aspects of the setting of that asset that may make a greater contribution. And I believe as has rightly been done by myself and the council, that all of those points need to be taken into account when assessing the degree of harm that the resulting change may have with key consideration of the PPG, the high test, and relevant high court decisions. Uh, just to, so I'm clear, so this is for the setting of the, you're, you're saying that the setting won't be um, affected by the building of this proposed site? No, we have discussed that there will be a change to the setting of the asset, which will result in less than substantial harm at the lower end of the spectrum to the overall significance of the asset. Setting itself is not an asset, so you cannot harm it. You change it, and then you assess the harm to the asset that may arise. Okay, um, thank you for that uh, clarification. Uh, if I may, then, I think I will um, go to your page 39 of your evidence. Um, and these are the maps of dated 1981 and 1992, please. Yes, I have those in front of me. Uh, your um, mouse skills are obviously faster than mine, just uh, while I bring this up. And on the um, extract from the 1981 Ordnance Survey map, uh, can you see the site marked on this uh, map? I can see the location of the site. It's not actively marked, but I can see the location of it. Yes. And so, yes, the, I, I think you just um, identified it. It's um, noted on this location as Butts, uh, Butts Batch um, on the map. 
and that is the same for the 1992 Ordnance Survey map. Is that correct? Bear with me. I just want to double check the position of the boundary. I'm um, sorry, the paddock location, um, but it is within that vicinity of the, where the annotation butts batch is. Um, and we've heard from other witnesses, but uh, so this basically confirms their, the um, points that they were making, that this location does actually have a name. It is an identifiable location on a map. I mean, it's difficult to agree with that annotation, but it does appear to be associated more with the road than, shall we say, the field. But, you know, there is an annotation on the map. Um, I, I, well, it's the general area, shall we I, say. I, I, it... <laughs> I mean, I don't wish to be pedantic, but the road is marked vertically as Butts Batch, and the, the site is marked horizontally as Butts Batch. Um, without wishing to be pedantic back, the wording annotation at Butts Batch is more in line with that of the paddock but irrespective I don't think there's any doubt that the area in which the site is located is known as the Butts Batch. Yes I'm grateful. So uh, you then, I, so I don't wish to um, go over the, uh, the any more about the church um, the, I think that my next point is the, your contention, I believe, in point seven point, let me see, section seven. Sorry, I, I missed the reference there. No, se uh, sorry, so section seven of uh, Ms. Armstrong's evidence. Uh, and, oh, sorry, no, I apologize. That's not, that's the conclusion. Uh, or further up. Uh, ah, yes, seven point one four, sir, and Miss Armstrong, uh, where you say the appeal site does, however, form part of the general approach to and from the exit of the settlement of Rington, and in turn the conservation area from the south. Although it is reiterated that the site is not located adjacent to the conservation boundary. Is that correct? That, yes, that is correct. And you then go on to say um, that Butts Batch Half Yard, um, which refers to the road outside of the conservation area, is transitional in character, marking the transition between the agricultural hinterland and now modern extent of the settlement and the historic core. Uh, that's correct. I believe it has a transitional character. And in 716, on the approach, the built form of the settlement of Rington is visible with undeveloped agricultural land in the foreground with the wider landscape rising in the background to the north. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct, but I would highlight that, um, or emphasize the word settlement because you're not ever think you're seeing, it, well, the majority of what you're seeing in that view is not within the conservation area. Um, I think you were present when um, Mr. Lea agreed that, it, that the village nestled in the uh, landscape, is that correct? I could be wrong, but I'm not entirely sure that was the agreement, but for the purpose of the conservation area, I'm not quite sure where, where the, where, whether the landscape reference in terms of the nestling is um, referenced, but it is clearly located within a topographical position that elevates itself to the north and to the south beyond the settlement boundaries. Yeah. I, I'm grateful. Uh, I'm sure um, the, the inspector will have the notes, but my recollection was that it was that he quite liked nestled, and he uh, the idea being that with the backdrop of the hills behind um, and the rural land in the foreground uh, and the folds, because of the way this uh, site uh, we agreed with undulating, but we say hill because. Uh, uh, then uh, it did nestle. Um, just on that point, uh, with your expertise um, of the historical aspect, could you offer any um, advice on what batch actually means in the historical context? Uh, not, uh, not in this context, no. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, if we then go to, and I'm afraid I'm going to scroll down to one of your 
photographs down the bottom of this page. I believe they're in Appendix A as well, or Appendix 1. Uh, and bear with me while I find it. Uh, I think I did make a note of it, but I, it was probably easier just to locate it on the screen. It's the approach into the village, ah oh, yes, page 4.12, 4 um, page 62. And could you describe, um, just because there will be people watching and uh, they won't see, know what we're looking at, can you just describe what you're seeing there, please? In which view, in which plate? Uh, sorry, uh, plate 4.12. This is the view taken from just south of the bridge. Um, it's looking north along Butts Batch and Half Yard. Um, you can see the, um, the sign to the village and you can also see the existing edge um, of the southern part of the settlement. Uh, the buildings that are visible are not within the bounds of the conservation area. The church mate tower may just be visible in that, but as we said, we've had some difficulty identifying it in photographs. But the, the houses that are visible um, are not located within the bounds of the conservation area. No, that, that's absolutely fine. Um, now, my, my point, um, because I'm not, I, I've left the church um, views um, behind, I'm now looking at the actual proposed site, which is that large green field um, just above the white entrance sign to the village. Is that correct? Uh, that is indeed where the appeal site is, yes. And so if we compare that view with its green fields and agricultural um, look, and I'm now going to go to the wire-framed uh, documents, uh, just bear with me. Can you give, please give the reference that you're referring to? I will do when I have uh, the, this, uh, the relevant photo, but it's basically the view from the south. Um, not, well, it, you've got figure 2.5a, but that's actually looking south, but it does sort of highlight the... Um, uh, in, uh, the impact of the uh, site on this uh, on this view, but if you, you'd have to sort of reverse it 180 degrees, but you can see the uh, wire framed uh, buildings above the hedge line. Is that correct? Well, firstly, can I confirm that we are in core document 5.28? Uh, Yes, C5.28. Yes, I'm um, sorry, could you please just confirm which of the particular viewpoint figures, was it 21A, you were, uh, sorry, 2.1A that you were looking at? Uh, no, 2.5A. 2.5A. Sorry, if I'm, uh, I wasn't uh, trying to lean too far into the microphone, but 2.5A. 2.5A. So that is the view um, looking south, yes. And... It could be wrong, maybe you've got better reference, but I'm just scrolling through. I can't see a view that would give, that would replicate what we saw in your photograph with how the, um, why, you know, the proposed um, development would have on this site. Have I missed it? I'm Are you sure. making reference to my 4.12? Uh, I am, yes. Then I believe the best... Photo, a photo montage for us to use would be um, one of the viewpoint twos, which is taken from just to the south of the Rington sign. There is not a viewpoint from, uh, there is not a wire frame viewpoint from further to the south. No, um, that's, I, I was just checking that. So, yes, I'm right in thinking that there's no replication of that view. No, give, there isn't. No. So, I'm afraid I'm going to have to um, uh, sort of bear with the, uh, or ask the inspector to bear with me slightly, but uh, and just try and visualise, um, and maybe it'll be clearer on a site visit about how the proposed development will impact 
um, as you approach into the village um, as given with this picture, which is 2.5a. Um, so I uh, think we need to be very careful with that statement and that you're referring to the approach into the village um, by which you're referring to the settlement. The edge of the conservation area does not reflect that of the settlement. In my viewpoint 4.12, you do not see the conservation area. So that has to be very mindful in terms of how the difference between experiencing the approach or exit from the settlement and experience and appreciation the exit um, or entrance to the asset and the two very different considerations that that may mean. No, and I, I appreciate that uh, clarification. Um, and you've just led me into my next point that uh, although you're um, saying that it's not what we're looking at is not pr the precise edge um, of the conservation area, that uh, the, can, the points have been made by ourselves and others about how this will urbanise the uh, approach through what is known as the southern gateway to the village um, due to the built form. Have you, uh, I'll ask the question, have you got any view on how, that, how this development will affect that uh, approach into this uh, village? Again, bringing this back to a heritage perspective, which is, is the matter that we're dealing with here, the key consideration is the, the experience and appreciation that that makes to the heritage significance of the asset and how that heritage significance might be changed um, as a res might be harmed as a result of the resulting change as clearly set out in my evidence and reflected in that of the local authorities this is a transitional character from landscape into the settlement, the edge in this location is principally associated with modern development before one progresses into the historic core. As I have set out in my evidence, that transitional character will be maintained. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, my point, you're, you're making the point that the um, Houses running now, obviously very visibly at right angles, um, westwards from this road, will not have any um, substantial effect on how you view the village or um, when compared to what is there now. Is that correct? Again, I will emphasize that my remit is heritage, and so it is not how I would view the village, it is how I would view the conservation area, which is different to the view of the village from this location, and it is the manner to which the experience contributes to the significance. I believe the transitional character which contributes will be maintained. Okay, um, thank you. I, think, I, I don't think there's any point uh, in con continuing this, sir. Uh, uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I think it's, it's worth sort of putting that, that last answer into, into the, the context of, of what this witness's evidence concerns, and it, it does concern the um, uh, proposed development's effects on, uh, as I understand it, designated heritage assets, specifically in this case the, uh, the listed church and the, and the conservation area. Um, but thank you. Um, Anything by way of re-examination, Mr. Boyle? No, sir. Thank you very much. Sorry, Mr. Ball, was that a, a, a no, thank you very much, or you I'm so sorry. You know, I, forgive me, I thought, I thought I said no, sir, thank you very much. But probably the, the, 
it, it being a, fr a Friday afternoon, but I, I was, I thought, that's a very long pregnant pause. Uh, Maybe I hadn't switched on my microphone when I said no. No, I, I'm afraid I was probably not, not but anyway. fully tuned in. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, thank you, Ms. Armstrong. That's, um, that's it, so far as witnesses are concerned this week. Um, I think it might be worth uh, just uh, trail this possibility earlier in the week um, regarding conditions, um, and, and I, f I think it's probably worth me just giving you a few um, a few thoughts to, to try and streamline things for um, the substantive condition session next week. And these these are really just sort of. Um, uh, questions, I suppose, um, for you to. Uh, so I'm not asking for a response now. I'm not asking for a conversation now. I'm just flagging them now so that you can give them thought, get your heads together, and, and, and agree or disagree, or, 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 or sort of uh, decide what you want to do with them. Uh, it's up to you. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through them as I've got them jotted down here. Um, and I may well come back to other conditions on uh, the substantive session, but these were just things that occurred to me. I've already um, sort of recognised that there's, there's distance between the main parties, that's to say the council and the appellant, regarding appeal A condition five. So I won't, I won't dwell on that. Uh, we've already had, I've already heard conversations and, and heard the evidence on that. Um, my first point... C condition nine on appeal A, um, it, it just struck me that the, the word looks crops up a lot in this condition, and I just wondered whether the, 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 there could be some rationalisation um, uh, of that. It appears four times. I'm not sure all four are needed, um, but you might tell me otherwise. Um, um, and I think a similar principle applies to uh, Condition 6 of Appeal B, because uh, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it, the purpose of a condition is, is similar and its contents are similar. Um, I just, but perhaps, perhaps the first or the second of the, of the, of the looks could be uh, omitted potentially. Uh, I'll, I'll see what you think of that. Um, I also wondered about there are a list of, of sort of points within condition nine, uh, Roman numerals one to five. Um, the fifth one says hours of lighting operation, which should be submitted to and approved in writing. Now this goes to the uh, uh, contents of, of details to be submitted. Um, and I, I just wanted to really understand whether, that, uh, whether that's necessary. And again, I'm not asking for a response now, but for you to go away and think about this. Is, is that necessary, and, and how realistic is it to, to control hours of lighting, um, and, and what lighting are we, we really thinking about here? Um, um, again, in Condition 9, this is, in my version anyway, it's a sort of penultimate line, it's the last sentence, this lighting shall be implemented and, and adhered to during the construction and operational phase. Um, I just wondered whether that wording was quite enough to secure retention. Um, is, is adhered to quite the right term? And, and, and if it is, does it, does it do enough uh, in the long term to maintain, retain condition nine, still in appeal A, um, there, uh, uh, similarly, there's a, a list or two lists of, of things to be secured uh, under the terms of this, and I, I didn't really understand why there were two lists. Um, there might be a very good and clever reason for it, but um, it wasn't obvious to me, uh, and I just wondered whether a single list, uh, whether the two lists could be brought together, um, uh, and if not, why not, really, this is what I wanted to understand. Uh, a similar principle applies to Condition 7 of Appeal B because it's a similarly constructed um, set of words. Um, moving on to Condition 11, Appeal A. Um, really, the last sentence uh, it reads, work should be implemented in strict accordance with the approved methodology. 
Um, I, I, again, it's, it's just in terms of precision, I suppose. Um, I wondered whether the approved work, works might be a more precise form of wording. Um, and I, again, I wondered whether there's enough here to secure implementation um, and adherence, just to borrow the term from the earlier one. So I'd like you to give some thoughts of that, please. Moving on to condition 14. Um, well, I've got a note to myself uh, reminding me to double check the plan number. Um, no reason to believe it's wrong, but uh, that's something I need to do. Um, so we can move on from that. A few of the conditions have got abbreviations, which, um, which are great if, if, if the abbreviation turns up again, but it, it, it doesn't. Um, it, that's a bit of a recurring theme. So we've got FRA and AOND and so on. So I think they're, they're, they're easily deleted unless there's a really good reason why they ought to be retained. And I, I couldn't see it personally. Um, I've just moving on to 18. Um, yeah, I just wondered whether this, this concerns sample panels um, uh, relating to um, facing materials and obviously appearance is a, a reserved matter. So I wondered whether this was strictly necessary at the outline stage and if it's considered that it is, I'd, I'd like to have a better understanding of why. Um, Condition 19 refers to a travel plan. I, I, presumably, this is the travel plan which is already in. It's a core document. My, my note is that it's C4.33. Um, if, if it is that travel plan, uh, perhaps it's worth being specific about its, its identity in terms of if it's got a reference number and when it was submitted and so on, just to avoid any confusion. Um, Skipping on to condition 23, still in appeal A. Um, this is the point that I, I flagged on Monday, the, the um, building regulations point. Um, next one, 24, this concerns, um, yeah, per parking. Um, storage and collection of waste. And, and, and similar details. Again, it seemed to me that this went goes to matters um, that are reserved anyway by, by the reserved matter condition. So uh, again, I'm, I'm questioning whether it's necessary uh, above and beyond the, um, the, um, the reserved matter type condition that appears earlier in the uh, schedule. Um, 25, uh, this is um, relates to Flooding matters. Uh, well, um, well, it reads: No dwelling should be occupied until details of an emergency evacuation plan in the event of flood has been submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Um, I was just wondering about what what happens thereafter. Whether there's there's a need for a long term um, clause, uh, and if not, why not? Twenty six. Um, again, Sorry, sir, can I interrupt you? Yeah. Can I just check? I was working from the conditions list in the Statement of Common Ground. Ah, have I gone wrong with my numbering? Um, no, it's just that number 25, I'm taking this on at the moment. Roger Wilmot, who's leading okay. on the conditions session, will be back next week. Mr. Coombs can probably confirm well, I, I, I whether that one was actually removed. I may have a redundant list. <laughs> I don't think much changed, if that helps. Okay. Well, we may, uh, I well, can clarify, sir, but assess in terms of the chronology of events uh, that preceded the, the inquiry setting. Sorry. I, I can assist with uh, the chronology of events in terms of the conditions, um, because you may have seen uh, various versions of conditions going back and forth, I believe, the week before the inquiry sat. Well, I, and they yeah, I suspect, in the I mean, judging, judging by the, the, the looks of confusion, <laughs> uh, I suspect I'm, I'm operating off... Uh, a superseded uh, iteration. That was the only comment you've made that uh, on condition 25. Okay. Everything else up to that point, yes. I don't believe, actually changed okay. from the version before. That, so what, what's... So the statement of common ground that's before you, you've got a, a appendix. Uh, yeah. I don't want to get too, I don't want to get too, too bogged down. 
So, yes, uh, appendices uh, four and five have agreed conditions lists for both yeah. Appeal A and Appeal B, respectively. Um, those were updated. Uh, that condition you referred to in terms of flood evacuation was um, omitted in agreement okay, with the so council. Okay, so that's gone. So let's um, ignore that one then, uh, which probably um, probably helps. So um, 26 would become 25. Uh, that, that concerns uh, landscaping um, should be carried out. Is that right? Okay. Uh, obviously, landscaping is a reserve matter, so that, that's, that's another one that sits in that category. And again, I'm. I'm questioning whether it's necessity as a consequence and, and the same applies to 26 um, which uh, starts any trees hedges and so on um, which brings us to what I hope is the last one on your list is it 27 on your list okay and this is a um, landscape ecological management plan uh, LEMP um, Yeah, I just put a, put a note to myself, really. The, the approved, this is the last sentence. The approved plan should be fully implemented and adhered to over the operational phase of the development. And um, I just wondered what that meant, operational phase, and, and whether everybody would understand it. So, again, don't, I'm not asking for advice now, just um, a position when the session comes and for you to have had that conversation. So, a few small points on... Appeal B, <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully we're all on the same page with the same conditions, but let's find out. Um, the second condition, um, this is, it reads, before any work is commenced, details of surface and hard standing and that landscaping of the site shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. Doesn't appear to have any kind of securing or implementation uh, aspect. Um, on the face of it. Um, so if you could apply yourselves to that. And condition five, which reads, no development should take place until details are proposed, means of protecting the privacy and so on. Um, yeah, I, um, it's an unusual one. And I'm not really sure what, what what sort of sits behind it and, 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 and why it's necessary, I suppose, is, is my point. Um, so I'd, I'd like to have a better understanding of that, uh, please, for that session. I think that is it, uh, other than the points I've already alluded to that's um, uh, similar to, uh, to Appeal A. Uh, yeah, that was it on, on conditions. Um, as I say, don't feel a need to, to have a conversation about them now, but if you can give those matters a bit of thought and, and uh, talk them through and uh, come to a joint position on them, I don't expect you to necessarily agree, but um, if, a, if a joint position could be come to, and if, if you feel it's necessary, any changes, uh, if they could be circulated before the session, that would be appreciated, please. Okay. Um, is there anything else before we adjourn for the week? Uh, so, <clears throat> so thank you. Mr. Jones, um, just to help you, um, obviously things can change, but what I think won't change is we won't be having him physically here on Tuesday. He, I'm told he's tested positive again, and so he's going to shield himself, or rather shield us perhaps, from him. Now, we were told very kindly we could do um, a patched-in Teams session, so that although we'll all be here, he'll be on a screen. This is still subject to him feeling well enough to give evidence. Uh, I, I'm informed that he is feeling better, so he's, he should be on the mend, but we all know how COVID can go up and down. So for the time being, we're expecting it to be Mr. Jones, um, but on a virtual format. And then we would follow on with Mr. Marsh and then the 106 and condition session. Okay, that's helpful. If, if there's any sort of change from that, if we can have an update um, just by correspondence uh, over the weekend or, or, or Monday. Um, but I think in the circumstances, that's, uh, that's a practical approach. And um, it sounds like the technology is there for, for all this to happen. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, trusting, uh, I'm trusting our host to, to, to sort that out. Um, 
Is there anything uh, from a council? Yes. Yeah, well, sir, just, just one matter arising out of that. I, I know there are difficulties with the technology, but I am wondering whether, if uh, Mr. Jones is to be heard remotely, I am wondering whether um, the sessions themselves, given that the participation of the Rule 6 party, I'm not saying it is not taking place, of course it is, but the um, Rule 6 party and the um, uh, third party uh, representatives, witnesses and so on are not um, likely to be physically present. I'm simply wondering whether those sessions might be dealt with remotely. And I say that, um, I mean, not purely for personal convenience. I, I'm just up the road in Bristol, so it's, it's not, not exactly a, 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 a long drive <laughs> or anything approaching it. What, what concerns me a little bit is the, um, and it arises out of what my own friend has just said, is the onset of the new COVID variant. Um, I mean, we've, we've managed this week, and I hope we're all going to go away um, <laughs> displaying no symptoms of anything. Um, but I, I throw this out for consideration. Uh, well, I, and I, 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 I know that those sitting behind me will say that there, there, there are um, uh, IT matters that need sorting out, and they have not yet been sorted out. Well, for, from a, a very personal point of view, I'm, I'm going to have to come back, come what may, because I need to do the site visit. Um, so um, it's kind of as, in, in a sense, it's as broad as it's long. And, and in one sense, it's, it, it, it makes it a little, little bit more difficult for me because um, from here, it's what, whatever it is, half an hour uh, from, from my home, it's not half an hour to the, to the site. It's, it's con very considerably more. So um, it, it may... It, it may make it difficult for me to, to do the site visit, for instance, if it was to be done on, on Wednesday after closings, uh, yes. which is kind of a way it's, it's pointing. Um, and I'm, uh, I've, I've got other things on on Thursday, so things kind of start getting pushed back. Um, have there are there any views from anybody else? Is there, is there a, a desperate Can desire I... to, to, to go to virtual at this stage? No, so my, my reception... Um, preference very strongly would be to stay with the face-to-face -face format for practical reasons as well as the usual reasons in terms of, of human interaction. Um, obviously, we're going to have to put Mr. Mr. Jones into a different category because of his medical condition, but the rest of us, <laughs> at least at the moment, <laughs> the rest of us are all hale and hearty. Um, f from a practical point of view, as you see, sir, I work from hard copy documents, I couldn't sensibly get them up to London this afternoon. I'm going on a train. Um, and to start a virtual um, uh, hearing Tuesday, Wednesday next week is actually significantly less convenient than to, for me to come back down here where all the papers are here, as indeed is my team. So for all of those reasons, I'm afraid I'm, I'm with the indication that you gave, which is uh, both actually and practically, um, it's better to stick with the face-to-face -face format. Um, given my, my, my practical issues and, and the balance team's practical issues, I think we will stick with. Um, okay, thank you. But it, it's it's uh, it was a nice thought, and, and, and in, in, in an ideal world, it, it would it would make life uh, life sort of easier and, and neater. But um, uh, I I wouldn't have raised it sir, had it not been for the fact that it is evident that um, regrettably. Um, COVID rates are rising yeah. considerably, yeah. and not only nationally, but um, in this neck of the woods too, because I've checked that as well. That was the only reason I, I, I mentioned it, but my and friend's quite right. It's more convenient in many ways to continue as we are. I think, yeah, it's, it's, uh, had, we, had we been sort of starting, um, uh, had, had the inquiry not started yet, it, it would be an easier, uh, a, a more practical fix. But. Um, Perf per per perfectly good question to, to, to pose. Uh, thank you. Okay, uh, anything else before we adjourn for the week and uh, resume on Tuesday? Re resumption on Tuesday, I think I've already indicated, uh, would be 10 o'clock just to help everybody to get here who've co coming from further afield. Um, if everybody's comfortable with that, we'll, we'll stick with that. I don't think there's any particular time uh, imperative at some um, problematic so we'll we'll go with that um
Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll adjourn there and um, hope you all have a safe trip back to wherever you're travelling to and uh, we'll resume next Tuesday. Thank you all.